Jake Mercer had seen strange things in his time with the Foundation, but nothing quite like this. He stood in the dimly lit chamber, the walls lined with concrete that seemed to drink in the light. At the center of the room sat SCP-025, a wardrobe that looked like it had been pulled straight out of an old Victorian home. The wood was dark, worn smooth by years of use, but something about it felt wrong. The grain in the wood seemed to twist and shift in the corners of his vision, like it was moving when he wasn't looking directly at it. Jake shook his head, trying to dispel the unease that had settled into his bones since stepping into the room. It was just a wardrobe, nothing more, nothing less. But the air felt thick, almost oppressive, as if it was charged with something he couldn't quite put his finger on. It reminded him of the quiet before a storm, when the sky turned that peculiar shade of green, and you could feel the electricity in the air. He reached into his coat pocket, pulling out a small voice recorder. The plastic felt oddly cold against his fingers. He thumbed the button and the device clicked on, the tiny red light blinking in time with his pulse. Jake Mercer, Site 17, documenting SCP-025, he said, his voice coming out quieter than he intended. He cleared his throat and tried again. Object appears to be an antique wardrobe, approximately seven feet tall, four feet wide. Exterior shows significant wear consistent with age, no immediate signs of anomalous properties. He approached the wardrobe slowly, each step echoing unnaturally in the confined space. The closer he got, the more the unease in his gut twisted. He tried to ignore it, tried to focus on the task at hand, but the sensation wouldn't leave him. It was like the wardrobe was watching him, waiting for something. Jake paused in front of the wardrobe, his hand hovering over the brass handle. The metal was tarnished, flecks of green corrosion dotting its surface. For a moment he considered just walking away, letting someone else handle the investigation. But the thought was fleeting, replaced by the stubborn curiosity that had driven him all his life. With a deep breath he grasped the handle and pulled. The door swung open with a creak that seemed far too loud in the silence of the room. Inside, the wardrobe was packed with clothing, dresses, suits, hats, all neatly arranged as if someone had just stepped away for a moment. The smell hit him immediately, a pungent mix of mothballs and something older, something that smelled like decay. He wrinkled his nose and stepped back, fighting the urge to close the door and leave. But he couldn't help himself, he had to know more. The clothes were old, that much was clear. Fashions from decades, maybe even centuries passed. But there was something else, something that made his skin prickle. The fabric seemed to shimmer in the low light, almost as if they were breathing. He reached out, fingers brushing against a heavy wool coat, and a chill ran through him. The texture was wrong, too rough, too cold. It felt more like touching flesh than fabric. Jake yanked his hand back, heart pounding. The wardrobe didn't move, didn't do anything but stand there, doors open, offering its contents like some twisted gift. But that didn't stop the irrational fear that was clawing at his mind. He stepped back, and the air felt thick with secrets, pressing down on him like a weight. He clicked off the recorder and shoved it back into his pocket, his hands shaking. He needed to get out of there, needed to put some distance between himself and that thing. It was just a wardrobe he reminded himself. Just an old piece of furniture. But as he turned to leave, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching him, that the shadows in the room were stretching out, reaching for him. The door to the chamber closed behind him with a heavy thud, and Jake let out a breath he hadn't realized he was holding. He would write his report, catalog his findings, and then move on to the next assignment. But as he walked down the sterile hallway, the weight in his chest remained. It was just a wardrobe, he told himself again. But deep down, he knew that wasn't true. Jake had always prided himself on being a rational man. He liked facts, numbers, and things that could be neatly catalogued and put away. But SCP-025 wasn't fitting neatly into anything. It was like a jagged shard that no amount of pushing and prodding would make smooth.
He sat at his desk, the dim light from his monitor casting a sickly glow across the piles of old files he'd been sifting through. The coffee in his mug had gone cold hours ago, but he hadn't noticed. His eyes were fixed on a grainy black and white photograph clipped to one of the reports. It showed a woman in what looked like a Victorian-era dress, her face obscured by a wide-brimmed hat. According to the notes, she'd been found dead in her home, her body twisted and broken like she'd fallen from a great height. The dress had been perfectly intact. He flipped through the report again, looking for something, anything, that might explain the connection between the clothing and the deaths. There had to be a logical explanation. But the more he read, the more uneasy he felt. Each account was different, yet eerily similar the clothes from the wardrobe, the inevitable tragedy that followed. Jake rubbed his eyes, trying to clear his head. He was letting his imagination get the best of him, that was all. The mind could play tricks, especially when dealing with something so steeped in mystery. But there was no denying that things had been off since he'd started this assignment. It had started small, just little things, an uneasy feeling when he passed by the wardrobe's containment chamber, a draft of cold air in his office, despite the warm summer outside. He'd chalked it up to nerves, or maybe the HVAC system acting up. But then came the incident with the coffee. It was late, and Jake had been the only one left in the office, working on his report. He'd gone to the break room to refill his mug when it happened. The handle of the mug snapped clean off as he lifted it, scalding hot coffee pouring over his hand and onto the floor. The pain had been immediate, sharp, and he'd cursed, jumping back. But when he looked down, his hand wasn't burned. Not even red. The coffee had been ice cold. He'd stood there, staring at the mess on the floor, trying to make sense of it. The mug had broken, sure, but the coffee had been hot, he was sure of it. But now, as he knelt to clean up the spill, it felt like he was wiping up a puddle of water that had been sitting out all night. Since then, the incidents had escalated. A small cut on his finger that wouldn't stop bleeding. A bookcase in his office collapsing suddenly, narrowly missing him. Each time, the wardrobe lingered in the back of his mind, a dark and looming presence. The more he tried to ignore it, the more persistent it became. Jake sighed and leaned back in his chair, staring up at the ceiling. He could feel the weight of the day pressing down on him, the thick air of the office doing little to soothe his nerves. The silence was too heavy, the shadows too deep. He was tired, and he knew he needed sleep, but he couldn't shake the thought that there was something he was missing. And then there was the coat. It was just a coat, an old wool thing with brass buttons, but the moment Jake had seen it hanging in the wardrobe, something had called to him. It was as if the coat was waiting for him, like it knew he was the one who would wear it. He didn't know why he put it on. Maybe he'd wanted to prove something to himself, to show that it was just a piece of clothing, nothing more. But the moment the heavy fabric settled on his shoulders, a wave of nausea had hit him. The room had spun, his vision blurring as a sharp pain stabbed at his side. He'd ripped the coat off, throwing it to the floor, his breath coming in ragged gasps. But the pain didn't go away. It lingered, a deep, throbbing ache that spread through his torso, making it hard to breathe. He'd staggered to the mirror, lifting his shirt to see a dark bruise blooming on his side, right where the coat had pressed against him. Now, sitting at his desk, the pain was still there, a dull reminder of his foolishness. He knew what the coat had done to him, what the wardrobe had done, but admitting it was another thing entirely. He was a rational man, a man of science. But as he sat there, his heart pounding in his chest, he couldn't help but feel that cold, creeping dread again. The wardrobe was dangerous. He knew that now. The stories in the files, the deaths, the accidents, they weren't coincidences. They were patterns. Patterns that he was now a part of. Jake glanced at the clock on the wall. It was past midnight, the building silent and still. But he couldn't shake the feeling that he wasn't alone. The air felt thick with something he couldn't name, 
something that made the shadows seem darker, the silence seem deeper. He needed to get out, to put some distance between himself and that cursed object. But as he stood to leave, a sharp pain shot through his side, doubling him over. He gasped, clutching at the bruise, and for a moment the room spun around him. When he finally looked up, the wardrobe was there in his mind's eye, doors open, waiting. Jake stumbled to the door of his office, flicking off the light and stepping out into the hallway. The pain subsided, but the unease didn't. As he walked down the corridor, each step echoing against the walls, he could swear he heard something, faint, distant, like the creaking of old wood. But when he looked back, the hallway was empty. Jake Mercer was drowning in history, and the deeper he sank, the darker it got. The files on SCP-025 were scattered across his desk like the remnants of a shipwreck. Yellowed pages, brittle with age, filled with scribbled notes and grainy photographs that told stories of horror stretching back decades. He'd read every one of them, more times than he cared to admit, and still, the answers eluded him. Every time he thought he was getting close to understanding the wardrobe, it slipped through his fingers like smoke. It wasn't just the reports, though. It was the dreams. Jake hadn't slept through the night in weeks. Every time he closed his eyes, the wardrobe was there, waiting. The dream started innocuously enough, a dark room, the faint outline of the wardrobe in the corner. But as the nights went on, the dreams grew more vivid, more twisted. The wardrobe would open, revealing not just clothes, but the things that had worn them. Twisted figures, their faces obscured, reaching out for him with hands that were more bone than flesh. He would wake up in a cold sweat, the image of those skeletal fingers burned into his mind. Even in the daylight, he couldn't shake the feeling that they were still there, just out of sight, waiting to pull him back into the nightmare. It was affecting his work, too. He couldn't focus, couldn't keep his thoughts straight. The lines between reality and nightmare were starting to blur. He would catch himself staring at the wardrobe in his mind's eye, the rest of the world fading away, until all that was left was that dark, looming shape. He had to know more. He had to understand. And so he kept digging. Jake had interviewed three past researchers who had worked on SCP-025, each more damaged than the last. The first, an older man named Dr. Abel, had been practically incoherent, mumbling about the curse and the darkness before breaking down into sobs. The second, a woman named Carter, had fared slightly better. At least she'd managed to hold a conversation, but her eyes had a haunted look that Jake couldn't forget. She spoke in clipped, hurried sentences, as if she was trying to get through the story before something caught up with her. And then there was Michael Hartman. Hartman had been one of the first to work on SCP-025, back when the Foundation had only just started cataloging the anomalies. He was in his 70s now, living in a care facility that catered to those with long-term mental illnesses. Jake had found him sitting by a window, staring out at nothing. Hartman's eyes were dull, his expression blank. But when Jake mentioned the wardrobe, something flickered in the old man's gaze. They're still in there. You know, Hartman had whispered, leaning in close as if the walls had ears. All of them, the ones who wore the clothes, they're still there. And they don't like to be disturbed. Jake had tried to get more out of him, but that was all Hartman would say. He spent the rest of the interview staring at his hands, muttering to himself. Jake had left the facility with a heavy heart and more questions than answers. As the days passed, Jake's obsession with the wardrobe deepened. He spent hours poring over the files, trying to find the connection between the clothing and the deaths. He combed through historical records, looking for any mention of the wardrobe before it came into the Foundation's possession. But there was nothing. It was as if the wardrobe had simply appeared one day, fully formed, with a history of death already attached to it. The more he searched, the more isolated he felt. The world outside his office began to fade, the normal rhythms of life slipping away. He stopped answering calls, stopped going home. 
His office became his entire world, the files his only companions. The wardrobe had him now, he knew that much. It was in his mind, in his dreams, pulling him deeper into its twisted history. He knew he was losing himself, but he couldn't stop. Every time he closed his eyes, he saw the wardrobe. And every time he opened them, he was one step closer to it. He was unraveling, his mind fraying at the edges, but the wardrobe kept pulling, and he kept going. It was during one of those late-night sessions, the room lit only by the harsh glow of his monitor, that he found it. A single photograph buried deep in the archives that made his blood run cold. The photo was old, its edges frayed and curling. It showed a grand, opulent room, the kind you'd see in a manor house or a palace. In the center of the room was the wardrobe. It looked the same as it did now, same dark wood, same ornate carvings. But what caught Jake's attention was the figure standing next to it. A man in a suit, his face turned away from the camera, his hand resting on the wardrobe's door. Something about the man's posture, the way he stood so close to the wardrobe, sent a chill down Jake's spine. He knew, without knowing how, that this man had been the wardrobe's first victim. Jake leaned closer to the monitor, squinting at the photo. The resolution was poor, the details blurry, but there was something else, something in the background, half hidden in the shadows. It was hard to make out, but it looked like another figure, standing just behind the wardrobe, barely visible in the gloom. Jake's heart pounded in his chest as he zoomed in, trying to get a better look. The figure was there, all right tall, thin, with long arms that seemed to stretch unnaturally. Its face was obscured, but Jake could feel its gaze on him, cold and malevolent. He blinked, and the figure was gone. Jake sat back in his chair, his breath coming in ragged gasps. He was losing it. The wardrobe was in his head, twisting his thoughts, making him see things that weren't there. But the photo was real. The man was real. And whatever had been behind the wardrobe, Jake wasn't sure he wanted to know. But he had to. The wardrobe wouldn't let him stop now. He shut off the monitor and stood up, swaying on his feet. The room spun around him, the walls closing in. He needed air. He needed to get out before the darkness swallowed him whole. As he stumbled out of his office, the shadows seemed to crawl along the walls, reaching out for him with twisted skeletal fingers. The air was thick, suffocating, filled with the scent of old, musty fabric. And behind it all, he could feel the wardrobe, waiting for him to return. Jake Mercer had always thought he was stronger than this. He'd faced down anomalies that could drive a person mad, stared into the abyss and walked away unscathed. But now, as he stood in front of SCP-025, the wardrobe's doors hanging open like the maw of some ancient beast, he realized just how wrong he'd been. He couldn't stop himself anymore. He had to know. He had to feel it, had to touch it. The clothes inside called to him, their whispers growing louder with each passing day. It was as if the wardrobe was in his blood now, pumping through his veins, infecting every thought, every breath. The first time he'd put on the coat, it had nearly killed him. But that didn't matter. He needed to understand, and the only way to do that was to give in. He reached out fingers trembling as they brushed against the soft fabric of an old velvet jacket. The moment his skin touched the cloth, a wave of cold washed over him, and the room seemed to tilt on its axis. Jake gasped, pulling the jacket off the hanger with a jerk. His hands moved on their own, slipping his arms into the sleeves, the fabric settling against his shoulders with an unnatural weight. It was too tight, squeezing his chest like a vice, but he couldn't bring himself to take it off. Instead, he turned to the mirror that stood in the corner of the room, its surface covered in a thin layer of dust. The reflection that stared back at him wasn't his own. It was still Jake, still his face, but the eyes were wrong, too wide, too bright, filled with a cold, malevolent hunger. His skin looked pale, almost sickly, and the jacket hung on him like a shroud. He looked like a man who had been dead for weeks.
He stepped closer to the mirror, heart pounding in his chest. The jacket felt heavier with each breath, the air thick with the scent of decay. He could feel it now, creeping under his skin, into his bones, wrapping around his heart like a noose. The room spun again, and he had to grip the edge of the mirror to keep from falling. Then the voice came, soft and insidious, whispering in his ear, Wear it. The word slithered into his mind, cold and sharp like ice water. Wear it and you'll know. Jake shook his head, trying to dispel the voice, but it only grew louder. The jacket seemed to tighten around him, squeezing the breath from his lungs. He clawed at it, trying to pull it off, but the fabric clung to him, the seams digging into his skin like the claws of some ancient predator. He stumbled back, crashing into the wardrobe. The doors creaked open wider, and from within he heard the faint rustle of fabric, like hundreds of unseen hands reaching out to him, dragging him closer. It's too late, the voice hissed. You're ours now. Jake fell to his knees, his vision blurring as the room seemed to fold in on itself. The walls twisted, warping into grotesque shapes, and the shadows grew darker, deeper, until they seemed to swallow the light entirely. He could feel them now, the others who had worn the clothes before him, their presence like a cold wind on the back of his neck. He was losing himself. He could feel his mind unraveling, thread by thread, as the jacket dug deeper into his flesh. The pain was excruciating, but even worse was the cold that seeped into his bones, numbing him to everything but the darkness. The walls pulsed with malevolence, the shadows whispering secrets that should have stayed buried. With a final, desperate effort, Jake tore the jacket from his body, throwing it across the room. The fabric hit the floor with a dull thud, and for a moment the room seemed to breathe. The shadows retreated, the walls straightened, and the air cleared. But the cold didn't leave him. It was inside him now, rooted in his core. He stumbled to his feet, his chest heaving with ragged breaths. The mirror showed his reflection once again, but this time he barely recognized the man staring back at him. His face was pale, drawn, his eyes hollow and haunted. He looked like he'd aged ten years in the span of a few minutes. But the worst part was the mark. A dark bruise had bloomed on his chest where the jacket had pressed against him, its shape disturbingly familiar. It looked like the outline of a hand, long fingers curling around his heart. Jake backed away from the mirror, his mind racing. He had to get out. He had to escape before the wardrobe claimed him completely. But even as he turned to leave, he knew it was already too late. The wardrobe had him, and it wasn't going to let go. As he stumbled through the halls of the Foundation, the world around him felt wrong. The lights flickered, casting long, twisting shadows that seemed to move on their own. Every sound echoed unnervingly, a cacophony of whispers and footsteps that followed him wherever he went. He reached the exit, his hand trembling as he pushed the door open. The cool night air hit him like a slap, but it did little to clear his head. He could still feel the jacket's grip on him, the cold hand that had wrapped around his heart. Jake looked back at the building, its dark windows staring back at him like empty eyes. He had to destroy the wardrobe. He had to end this, whatever the cost. But even as he made the decision, the shadows seemed to laugh at him, the sound echoing in his mind. He was already theirs. The wardrobe had taken him, piece by piece, and now there was nothing left but the darkness. Jake Mercer knew he was running out of time. The wardrobe had its hooks in him, pulling him deeper into its darkness with every passing hour. He could feel it now, an invisible tether that dragged him back to the containment chamber, no matter how far he ran. There was no escape, no hiding from it. The only option left was to fight, but how did you fight something that wasn't alive, that wasn't human? He stood outside the chamber, his breath coming in short, panicked bursts. His body ached, his mind felt like it was fraying at the edges, and the bruise on his chest, dark and angry, throbbed with a pain that went beyond flesh.
He knew that whatever happened next, he might not survive it. But he couldn't let the wardrobe win. Not after everything it had taken from him. Jake clenched his fists, steeling himself. His plan was half-formed, a desperate gambit that relied more on hope than reason. He had found some old records buried deep in the Foundation's archives, detailing previous attempts to destroy anomalous objects. Most of them had failed, but a few had succeeded, usually through methods that involved intense heat or explosives. The wardrobe was wood, old, twisted, evil wood, but wood nonetheless. It could burn. It had to burn. He'd gathered what he needed, gasoline, matches, and a sledgehammer. It was primitive, but it was all he had. He just had to get inside, pour the gas, light the match, and destroy the thing before it destroyed him. The door to the chamber creaked as he pushed it open, the sound like a groan from the bowels of the earth. The air inside was colder than he remembered, sharp with the scent of decay and something fouler. The wardrobe stood in the center of the room, its doors slightly ajar, as if it was waiting for him. Jake swallowed hard and stepped inside, the sledgehammer heavy in his hands. Every instinct screamed at him to turn and run, but he forced himself forward, one agonizing step at a time. The wardrobe loomed larger with every footfall, the shadows around it twisting and writhing as if alive. It wasn't just a piece of furniture, it was something more, something ancient and malevolent, and it was hungry. He stopped in front of it, staring at the dark wood, the ornate carvings that seemed to pulse with some internal life. His hand shook as he uncapped the gasoline canister and began to pour, the liquid splashing against the wood with a hiss that sounded almost like a sigh. Time was running out. He could feel the wardrobe's presence pressing down on him, a crushing weight that made it hard to breathe. The shadows grew darker, deeper, and he thought he saw movement, faint, almost imperceptible, like something shifting just out of sight. They were coming. Jake fumbled for the matches, his hands trembling so badly that he almost dropped them. He could hear whispers now, growing louder, more insistent. The voices of the dead, the ones who had worn the clothes, who had been consumed by the wardrobe. They were screaming at him, begging him to stop, to leave, to join them. He struck the match. The flame flared to life, a tiny spark in the overwhelming darkness. Jake stared at it for a moment, mesmerized by the way it flickered, so fragile, so small. But it was all he had. He brought it to the wood, the gasoline-soaked grain catching instantly, fire racing up the side of the wardrobe with a roar. For a moment, nothing happened. The flames danced across the wood, hungry and bright, and Jake thought he'd done it. He thought he'd won. Then the wardrobe screamed. It wasn't a sound that could be made by anything human. It was a howl of pure, unadulterated rage and pain, a noise that reverberated through Jake's bones and made his teeth ache. The flames began to twist, curling back on themselves, turning black and cold as if the fire itself was being devoured. The shadows exploded out of the wardrobe, thick tendrils of darkness that snaked across the floor, the walls reaching for him. Jake swung the sledgehammer wildly, smashing it into the wood with all the strength he had left. The impact sent splinters flying, but the wardrobe barely seemed to notice. The darkness wrapped around his legs, pulling him down, dragging him toward the gaping maw of the wardrobe. Jake screamed, swinging the hammer again and again, but it was no use. The wardrobe was alive, it was angry, and it was hungry. He felt himself being pulled closer, the cold seeping into his skin, his bones. The voices grew louder, a cacophony of screams and pleas that threatened to tear his mind apart. He could see them now, the others, their twisted, broken forms reaching out for him, their eyes hollow and black. He was losing. Jake's vision blurred, the edges of the world growing dark. The wardrobe's doors yawned open wider, revealing an abyss of darkness that went on forever. He could see the flames still burning, but they were cold now, cold as the void, and they licked at him with tongues of ice. But he wouldn't give up.
With one final, desperate effort, Jake ripped the sledgehammer from the shadow's grasp and brought it down with all his might. The wood cracked, splintering down the middle, and for a brief moment the shadows recoiled, the darkness retreating. Jake gasped, dragging himself back from the edge of the abyss. The wardrobe shuddered, its form warping, twisting, as if trying to hold itself together. The fire flared up again, brighter this time, hotter. The shadows screamed, the voices wailing in agony as the flames consumed them. Jake staggered back, his body battered and broken, but he watched as the wardrobe began to burn in earnest. The wood blackened, curling in on itself, the carvings melting away into nothing. The shadows writhed, but they were losing, and with one final, ear-splitting scream, the wardrobe collapsed in on itself, the fire swallowing it whole. The room fell silent. Jake collapsed to the floor, gasping for breath. His body was a mass of pain, his mind teetering on the brink of collapse, but he'd done it. He'd destroyed the wardrobe. He could still feel the darkness in his veins, the cold that had seeped into his bones, but it was fading now, replaced by a warmth that spread through his chest, his limbs. He'd won. The fire died down, the last embers flickering out as the wardrobe turned to ash. Jake lay there for what felt like hours, staring at the ceiling, the silence of the room pressing down on him like a blanket. His mind was a jumbled mess, memories and thoughts twisted together in a knot he couldn't untangle, but one thing was clear. It was over. Jake finally pushed himself up, his body screaming in protest. He stumbled to the door, his vision swimming, but he made it. The hallway outside was dark, silent, but it felt different now. The air was lighter, cleaner, as if the building itself was breathing a sigh of relief. He looked back at the room one last time, at the pile of ash that had once been the wardrobe, and he felt a strange sense of peace. He'd lost so much, sacrificed more than he'd ever thought possible, but in the end he'd won. But as he turned to leave, something caught his eye, a glint of metal in the ashes. He froze, heart pounding, as he bent down to pick it up. It was a brass button, tarnished and worn, but unmistakable. Jake's blood ran cold. The wardrobe was gone, but its curse had left its mark. And Jake knew, deep down, that this wasn't over. Jake Mercer had never felt so empty. He sat in his apartment, the curtains drawn tight against the world outside. The room was dark, lit only by the flickering glow of the television. But he wasn't watching it. The sound was turned off, the images a meaningless blur as they danced across the screen. He didn't care. Nothing mattered anymore. Not after what he'd been through. Not after what he'd lost. The Foundation had declared the mission a success. SCP-025 was destroyed, its remains swept away and incinerated, the ashes scattered somewhere safe and distant. They'd offered him commendations, even a promotion, but Jake had refused. All he wanted was to be left alone. But even in the silence of his apartment, he wasn't alone. The memories haunted him, twisting through his mind like a knife, reopening wounds that hadn't yet healed. He saw the wardrobe every time he closed his eyes, felt the cold touch of the shadows as they dragged him toward that abyss, and the voices. The voices were still there, whispering in the back of his mind, telling him things he didn't want to hear. He tried to forget, tried to move on, but the wardrobe had left its mark on him. He could still feel it, the cold hand wrapped around his heart, squeezing tighter with every passing day. The bruise on his chest had faded, but the pain remained, a constant reminder of what he'd done, what he'd lost. Jake reached for the bottle on the coffee table, his hand trembling as he poured another shot of whiskey. The liquid burned as it went down, but it didn't dull the pain, didn't chase away the ghosts that lurked in the corners of his mind. Nothing did. The darkness was always there, just out of sight, waiting for him to let his guard down. He wondered if he'd ever truly be free. 
The doorbell rang, cutting through the silence like a gunshot. Jake flinched, his heart racing as he stared at the door, half expecting to see the shadows slipping through the cracks, oozing into his apartment like the malevolent presence he knew they were. But the shadows stayed where they were, and the door remained closed. The bell rang again. Jake set the glass down, wiping his hands on his jeans as he stood. His legs felt weak, unsteady, as if the ground beneath him might give way at any moment. He crossed the room slowly, each step echoing in the quiet, his breath coming in shallow, ragged gasps. He opened the door. A woman stood on the other side, her face pale and drawn, her eyes wide with something that looked like fear. She was holding a box, old and battered, wrapped in faded brown paper. Jake didn't recognize her, but something about her was familiar, like a half-remembered dream. Mr. Mercer, her voice was soft, trembling. Jake nodded, his throat too tight to speak. She held out the box, her hands shaking. I... I'm sorry, but you need to take this. Jake frowned, glancing down at the box. What is it? The woman didn't answer. She just shoved the box into his hands and turned, walking away without another word. Jake watched her go, confusion and unease gnawing at his gut. He looked down at the box again, the paper rough under his fingers. It was heavier than it looked, the weight of it somehow wrong, like it was pulling him down. He closed the door, his heart pounding in his chest. The box felt cold, even through the paper, and he could feel that familiar chill creeping up his spine, the one that told him something wasn't right. But he couldn't stop himself. He had to know what was inside. Jake tore off the paper, his hands moving on their own, driven by a force he couldn't control. The box was old, the wood scratched and worn, the hinges rusty. It creaked as he opened it, the sound echoing in the silent apartment. Inside, lying on a bed of tattered velvet, was a single brass button. Jake's breath caught in his throat. He knew that button. He'd seen it before, held it in his hand in the ashes of the wardrobe. It was the same button that had been sewn onto the coat he'd worn, the one that had nearly killed him, the one that had marked him. He stared at the button, his mind reeling. This wasn't possible. The wardrobe was gone. He'd destroyed it, burned it to ash. But the button was here, solid and real, a piece of the past that refused to stay buried. And as he looked at it, he felt the cold return, stronger this time, deeper. The shadows in the room seemed to grow darker, the air thick with the scent of decay and something older, something ancient. Jake stumbled back, the box falling from his hands, the button rolling across the floor. He wanted to run, to get as far away as possible, but his legs wouldn't move. The darkness was closing in, wrapping around him like a shroud, and he knew, he knew, he knew, that he'd never escaped it. The wardrobe had taken him, and it wasn't done yet. The shadows whispered to him, their voices soft and insidious slipping into his mind like poison. They told him things, things he didn't want to hear, but couldn't ignore. They told him that the wardrobe wasn't gone, that it was still out there, waiting for him, waiting to take him back. Jake sank to his knees, his head in his hands, the voices growing louder, more insistent. He could see the wardrobe now, in his mind's eye, the doors swinging open, the darkness inside yawning wide. It was calling to him, pulling him back into the abyss, and he knew that no matter how far he ran, no matter how hard he fought, it would find him. He was lost. The shadows closed in, and Jake felt the cold settle into his bones, into his heart. The brass button gleamed in the darkness, a tiny, malevolent spark, and he knew what he had to do. He knew how this would end. Jake reached for the button, his fingers closing around it, and the darkness swallowed him whole. 